Morning. We have general questions. Question one, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it proposed a land commission will identify landowners and plan diversity of ownership. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The structure, role and remit of the proposed Scottish Land Commission is currently, of course, out for consultation. However, the Commission will play a key role in ensuring our package of proposals achieve our desired outcome of greater diversity of land ownership in Scotland. The set of proposals published last week are far-reaching. They build on the measures we have already taken over the last few years and have the potential to transform Scotland's concentrated pattern of land ownership. And some specific measures to encourage that greater diversity are, of course, enabling Scottish ministers to intervene where the scale of land ownership or decisions by landowners are a barrier to local development, and also, of course, improving the existing community right to buy and introducing a new right to buy as part of the current Community Impairment Bill. And we've extended the Scottish Land Fund and we'll be increasing it to £10 million per year from 2016 to 2020. So our land must benefit the many, not the few, and our proposals will do just that. Rob Gibbs. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Um, uh, the EU is proposing a fourth money laundering directive uh, which could reveal beneficial ownership of Scottish trusts, including landed property. Um, do you think that this would be a means for us to find out about ultimate beneficial owners and indeed a register which these entities, estates and properties had to contribute to? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> well, I certainly hope so. And a central theme of the Land Reform Review Group's report was the need, of course, for better information, transparency and accountability of land ownership. And we have already, as a government, committed to completing the land register within 10 years, with public sector land being registered within five years. And, of course, our consultation asks how we can improve further the information we hold on land ownership and how to make it more transparent, if possible. But I think it's fair to say that the action being taken in Europe, combined with the measures I've just outlined being taken here in Scotland to improve transparency and accountability of land ownership, will shine a light into the darkest recesses of land ownership. And that will be great for the future of democratising lands, how it's used, how it's managed, and the benefits it can deliver for Scotland in the future. Question two, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Citizens Advice Scotland report working at the edge childcare. Minister Aileen Campbell. I welcome the Citizens Advice Scotland report of last week, which raised concerns about the cost of childcare and which articulated the challenges that parents face. We know and understand that childcare costs are a considerable outlay for families, and that's why, through the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, we are investing £329 million in this financial year and next to expand funded uh, early learning and childcare for three and fours to 600 hours. This represents an increase of 45 per cent since 2007, an increase which will save families up to £700 per year per child. We have made clear our wish to go further. The First Minister has outlined this Government's ambition, if re-elected, to deliver an increase in early learning and childcare provision for three and four-olds and eligible twos from 16 hours a week to 30 hours a week by the end of the next Parliament. Jimmy Day. <coughs> I thank the Minister for that answer. The Citizens Advice Scotland report found that nearly one in four councils report that they do not feel there is enough childcare for working parents. Therefore, what more can the Scottish Government do in conjunction with councils to increase the provision of childcare across Scotland and to address the specific concerns which include the need for summer holiday childcare for school-aged children and to address the need in areas such as Edinburgh where school finishes at lunchtime on a Friday as both of these uh, situations present a real difficulty for working parents on low incomes who do struggle to pay for increased childcare on Fridays during term time and struggle to pay for childcare during the summer months. Minister. Regarding the asymmetric school week, local authority schools have to be open for 190 days each year, but it is up to the council to decide the length and the structure of the individual school day, week or year, taking account of local circumstances. Any proposals to change the school week would be subject to consultation involving schools, parents and the wider community. But we absolutely appreciate that the need for childcare doesn't stop when a child starts school and that finding affordable and flexible provision can be a challenge for parents. And that's why the, the Act has introduced a duty on local authorities to consult locally on out-of-school care, which will broaden the scope for consultation and planning beyond early learning and childcare in order to meet the needs of all families. And although local authorities in terms of early learning and childcare are looking at ways to reconfigure services to provide the flexibility that's needed and requested through the legislation. That includes, for instance, bleeding the hours of 600 hours into the summer holidays. The key, though, is listening and responding to parents' needs. 
In addition, I have asked the Early Years Task Force to look at what more we can do on out-of-school care, and Professor Imran Siraj's ongoing workforce review will also look at out-of-school care as well as early learning and childcare, and we look forward to receiving her report in the spring of next year. But, you know, if the member wants to raise these concerns directly with me, I'm happy to meet with him, uh, and I'm sure my uh, colleague Alistair Allen on the specific issue of asymmetric school weeks will be happy as well. Question three, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, um, government sorry, what consideration it is giving to Unison's campaign to bring ancillary services in-house at Hare Myers Hospital in East Clyde. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The provision of soft facilities management services such as cleaning and catering play a, a key role in the delivery of clinical services in NHS Scotland. The Scottish Government therefore believe that NHS Scotland should be responsible for the direct delivery of these services wherever possible. The Hare Myers contract requires the benchmarking of soft facilities management services every seven years. The next benchmarking exercise is currently underway. In order to satisfy myself that NHS Lanarkshire has explored all the options available to it, I have now commissioned the Scottish Futures Trust to undertake an independent review of the situation and provide a report to my officials. I have requested that NHS Lanarkshire do not proceed until I have received this report and consider its findings. Linda Fabiani. Um, may, I, may I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And can I impress upon her um, the concerns that people in East Kilbride have about the recent report um, into Hare Myers Hospital about cleanliness and also the fact that the vast majority of people in East Kilbride believe that these services should come back in-house? And can I ask that due consideration is given to the information and the findings that Unison and associated bodies have about this subject. Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Linda Fabiani that it's made, been made very clear to NHS Lanarkshire that the findings of the report into cleanliness standards uh, has uh, to, to be addressed as a, a matter of urgency and we are reassured that action uh, has and, and is being taken to, to do that. Uh, in terms of um, the concerns raised by Unison. I am well aware of those. Uh, yesterday, I met with uh, Lillian Maser, who is the employee director of NHS Lanarkshire, to inform her uh, of the, the action that I have taken as set out in my, my first answer. And, uh, and we then need to, to allow that to take its course. Lillian Smith. Thank you, President. Uh, I've also been contacted by a number of my constituents on this issue. So I wonder if we could just be clear. Will the Minister actually encourage a bidding process that allows public sector bids to enable the services to be brought back in-house at Hare Myers and at Wishaw, rather than just allowing this roll-on of the contracts? Well, I'm sure Elaine Smith will understand that there are a number of legal issues uh, to be explored here, which is why I've asked the Scottish Futures Trust to undertake uh, the review of the situation and to look at all of the, the options uh, and to make sure that NHS Lanarkshire has explored all of the options available to it. This, these situations are, are not easy uh, in the light of the, the contracts uh, that are in place. However, I hope I've made clear to Elaine Smith through my answer to her and previous answer to Linda Fabiani that the reason I've asked the Scottish Futures Trust to look at this is indeed to look at whether there are any options that NHS Lanarkshire could take. Uh, um, and we have to await uh, the review that is going to be undertaken. And I've urged the Scottish Futures Trust to do that as quickly as possible. Question four, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to NHS Lanarkshire with recruiting staff for emergency and general medicine services. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government works with all NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire and key stakeholders, to, to, to support their efforts in staff recruitment, both from Scotland and elsewhere in the UK and from out with those areas. The Scottish Government is supporting NHS Lanarkshire in aligning its staff to meet patient demand. And, and in implementing a number of site-specific actions. I do the Cabinet Secretary for, for, for that answer, but is the Cabinet Secretary aware that, in addition to Lanarkshire's fragile a &E departments where NHS board continuity planning means closing one of them, our out-of-hours GP service has been reduced from five centres to three, two, or on several occasions, one centre staffed by one GP and four nurse practitioners for the whole of Lanarkshire, 
even before Christmas holidays are taken into account. What is the government going to do to address the shortage of on-call GPs, which adds to the pressure of a &E departments? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, can I uh, reassure the member that uh, Lanarkshire uh, has rightly prepared uh, contingency plans. They are working uh, hard to, to make sure that, uh, that they resolve some of the issues that uh, the member has outlined. What I should also say to the member, though, is that uh, some of the recruitment difficulties that NHS Lanarkshire is facing are not unique to NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, there are challenges uh, within uh, some of the, the specialisms uh, that are well known, not least in uh, emergency medicine. What I can say to him is that in terms of uh, NHS Lanarkshire, uh, that the workforce is up by over 11 per cent uh, since uh, 2006. Uh, uh, GP numbers have increased by over 7 per cent uh, within the area as well. Uh, so, although there are challenges, and I absolutely recognise them, and we are in close contact with NHS Lanarkshire to support them to overcome these challenges, mm -hmm. we do indeed have a record number of staff, and it is about making sure that we help NHS Lanarkshire to work through the issues identified. Question five, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to boost the economy in East Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting sustainable economic growth across Scotland, including in East Ayrshire. We work closely with a wide range of delivery partners, including Scottish Enterprise and East Ayrshire Council, using all available levers to deliver growth. Recent boosts to the East Ayrshire economy include an award of £1.3 million from the Scottish Government's Regeneration Capital Grant Fund to East Ayrshire Council for the Kilmarnock Town Centre Business Hub. This complements specific business support, including three regional selective assistance awards in 2014, worth over £2.3 million and creating 485 jobs. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? He will know that in East Ayrshire, unemployment rates are currently 10.5% compared to the Scottish figure of 7.1%. And while Scotland's unemployment rates are, are improving, ours in East Ayrshire has been worsening since the AGO left in 2009. Um, given that East Ayrshire is proposing a £10 million investment today in economic development, could the Cabinet Secretary give me some encouragement that this might be matched by the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. What I can say to uh, Mr Coffey, first of all, is that I very much welcome the commitment of East Ayrshire Council to economic development. It highlights an example of good practice where a local authority is investing to support uh, business growth. And um, in the statement that I will give to Parliament later on this afternoon, I will have more to say about the issues in connection with um, business encouragement by local authorities um, in their localities. Um, on the question of additional funding for the East Ayrshire economy, uh, obviously uh, through the work that the Government takes forward with Scottish Enterprise, we are focused on supporting projects that will deliver economic benefit and supporting companies that have the potential to deliver economic growth. And that will remain the focus of all discussions that we have with partners in connection with supporting the East Ayrshire economy. Question six, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with pension fund administrators regarding investment opportunities to support capital infrastructure projects. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Futures Trust engages directly with pension funds and a number of third parties acting on their behalf with regard to financing opportunities into Scottish infrastructure projects. As part of that engagement, they have had recent discussions with Aviva, MNG, Prudential, Alliance, Legal and General, and Standard Life. Mark MacDonald. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. At the Local Government and Regeneration Committee recently, the Deputy First Minister indicated a level of frustration with the approach taken by pension funds regarding the opportunities to support capital projects which would secure a return on investment, present a more ethical investment than, for example, tobacco, and would support local employment. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any plans to approach pension fund administrators, particularly in the public sector, in respect to future opportunities to support capital projects in their areas? Cabinet Secretary. 
I'm well aware of previous uh, efforts to uh, have pension funds for, for example, local authorities uh, use those funds towards infrastructure projects in their own area. I think in particular uh, Edinburgh City Council looked at the issue in relation to the purchase of uh, uh, Edinburgh Airport previously, and other uh, authorities have done the same. But we have uh, no immediate plans to try and pressurise local government pension fund authorities and their pension committees to use pension fund money to invest in infrastructure projects because uh, investment decisions are made by local government pension fund pension committees. Uh, ministers, have, ministers have not intervened in the past. It is a matter for local authorities. There are changes coming to the pension committees in April of next year, which will ensure uh, that these committees are 50-50 in terms of local authority representation. And we believe this is a, a decision that should remain with the local authorities and the, the members that they have on the pension committees, and also in light of, of course, their fiduciary duties. Question number seven, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve public transport in South Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. As part of our commitment to improve transport connectivity for local communities and businesses, the Scottish Government has provided over £113,000 to third sector organisations for community transport services in South Scotland. We have also funded £353 million in the Borders Railway to ensure local people can connect directly to our capital city and the wider Scottish Rail Network. In addition, over £1 billion has been invested annually across Scotland in public transport, including local bus services and other sustainable transport options, such as cycling. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As you will be aware, revised timetables for the Lanarkshire services to Glasgow and beyond begin operation at the end of this week. A number of constituents have contacted me to highlight their concerns on the impact of these changes on work, training, health appointments and leisure. ScotRail have told me that formal consultation on the changes took place in June, yet the first I was aware of these changes was in an email in mid-November. I am deeply concerned at the lack of public engagement on these proposals, and can the Cabinet Secretary clarify for me, please, and my constituents, who is responsible for ensuring that adequate public engagement on timetable changes is made, and provide assurances that steps will be taken to allow concerned constituents to make their views on these changes known as part of the next timetable consultation? To clarify for the member, it is the responsibility of Scott Rail. They are the ones that uh, propose the timetable changes. Um, I will, of course, check to make sure they went through the proper procedures when the consultation took place in the middle of last year. This issue has also been raised with the Transport Minister and the local member, uh, Aileen Campbell, as well. So it has been looked at by the Transport Minister. I'm confident they did go through the correct procedures, but we will check that. And I would say to the member, if you'd like to meet with the Transport Minister, I'm sure she'd be happy to uh, have a discussion with him about these issues as well. Question eight, Malcolm Tism. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken in relation to Palamas wave power since it went into administration. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, Palamas has been unable to find sufficient private investment to avoid administration despite efforts by the Scottish Government and the enterprise bodies over the last year. Our immediate concern is the impact of redundancies on staff and their families. Support for affected employees is through the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment PACE initiative. The PACE national team spoke to the administrators KPMG on Friday the 5th of December and again on Tuesday the 9th of December. No redundancies are likely this week and KPMG have undertaken to inform the national PACE team if their services are required. Mr Ewing has also spoken to the administrator directly. Palamas continues to trade while a buyer is sought. Bids for the assets of the company were invited by Tuesday morning and are now being evaluated by KPMG. In its operations to date, we believe Pal Palamas has raised a total of £95 million worth of funding. The vast majority of this, approximately £70 million, is from private sources. Administration arose because private funders withdrew their further support. Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise have been the last remaining funders in Palamas for some time, but our legal obligations under EU law prevent us from continuing as sole funders of the company. The Scottish Government is now establishing Wave Energy Scotland to continue our support for Wave Energy. Malcolm Chisholm. Cabinet Secretary, for the answer, I thank Fergus Ewing for giving me a meeting, uh, having given me a meeting about the subject. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it would be a tragedy if um, wave power development uh, no longer took place in Scotland, which is one possible outcome uh, of recent developments? Will he do everything possible to ensure that the expertise built up in Palamas is retained in Scotland for wave power development? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, f first of all, can I, uh, can I agree wholeheartedly with what Malcolm Chisholm has said? And can I also thank Malcolm Chisholm for the way in which he has pursued this particular issue? 
Uh, the Government and its agencies over a sustained period of time have given significant support to uh, the development of wave power in Scotland. I think that has been clear from the policy agenda of the Government and also from our financial decisions. But we have reached the point, as I indicated in my answer, where the public sector would be the, the sole remaining funders of the company and in EU law that, that, that we are prevented from acting in such a fashion. 